It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 338 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 14th of July, 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi. And as always, if you like the show, please go to scienceontop.com slash donate where you can sign up and become a Patreon. And you can help Do it. chip in some money. Do it now. <laughs> Let's begin with a new word that I learned today. Cryptobenthic literally means hidden bottom dweller. <laughs> so, Does that mean you live in a hidden hidden bottom or you are hidden in a bottom? I'm, you, well, I'm very, it means you live on the bottom of the sea and you live in hidden crevices and cracks and out of the way. I just said cracks and I shouldn't be talking about cracks with bottom dwellers. Bottom <laughs> shit. <laughs> well... Penny, tell us all about the cryptobenthic fish and why they're essential for thriving coral reefs. Yeah, I hadn't really heard the term cryptobenthic, but I could have a good guess at um, what it was because of cryptozoology, mm. which is people who are, you know, off looking for yetis and bigfoots and whatevers. But um, these are sort of fish that really aren't seen. They're mostly really little, like, re you know, centimetres long, and they're hidden away so that's why you know they're not actually hidden for their lives but you know for our purposes you know if you're diving in a reef you're probably looking at the big flashy fish that are just like flying around in the middle of the water um <laughs> the big flashy the big flashy fish, fish. well you know the ones like, that are all look at me look I'm at a me i'm fish. a parrot fish like i'm <laughs> 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 Sorry, I shouldn't. Well, no, to be fair, even <laughs> these <laughs> tiny. No, I'm like, ooh, some of these fish are endangered. But these tiny <laughs> cryptobenthic fish, them. some of them are these quite flashy as well. They're brightly coloured. They're just no, so they're small and they're hiding. If they like... were big and out there, they would probably be um, more known. But they're really, really important. And what I found interesting about this was it ties to a really simple concept, which is that idea of the flow of energy through an ecosystem. But some of the numbers just staggered me. So the idea of the way that energy flows through an ecosystem is that you've got, you know, your producers, which are your plants or your photosynthetic or chemosynthetic organisms, the ones that are getting, that they're sort of fixing energy into sugar molecules, but from other sources. So, you know, plants use light to make their sugar and to get the energy to make their sugar and so on. Um, and then you'll have a large amount of sort of, primary or first order consumers which are the organism herbivores the ones that eat the plants and then fewer and fewer numbers in this kind of pyramid you know you can't have a food pyramid which has like you know one blade of grass supporting six tigers it just doesn't work so those you know those higher order so you have this pyramid you have this huge amount of producers um you know a smaller amount of herbivores a smaller group of organisms that are eating them a smaller group of organisms that are eating them you've got your top predators at the top of the pyramid so in the reef it's really really interesting because these cryptobenthic fishes which we don't really see we don't really think about actually essentially seem to be basically um nourishing or like being at the foot of this reef ecosystem because 70% of them would be eaten every week. What? So if you take a snapshot, yeah, this every is what I found week. amazing reading this, every week. every week. But they also have an incredibly quick reproductive cycle. So there's always constantly new ones coming. Yeah, but that's, so, that's, an, that's a stressful living yeah, it's environment. A huge Can you just amount. imagine? That's a stressful living like, in Nasty, brutal. <laughs> <laughs> just, oh, well, this is a nice reef, isn't it, Barry? Ba Barry? Ba yeah. Oh, my God. What happened to Barry? Neville, did you see? Ba oh, God. Neville's gone as well. Hey, Terry. Oh, my God. Everyone's dying. 
I feel sorry for these fellas. Yeah. They all tried to feed, feed uh, single blades of grass to a pride of lions. <laughs> That's why they died. <laughs> but anyway. For lionfish. You've got this group of fish who live fast, die young. But what's really interesting about them is if you think, of, if you imagine that pyramid I was talking about, if you take a snapshot, which is what a standard kind of survey does, it kind of looks at the biomass or like the, the, the mass of all the adults of a particular species on any day or any time you do that, there's not going to be as many of them. That bottom rung of the pyramid may not look as essential as it is. But if you think about the turnover of adults, how quickly they're maturing and, you know, being replaced, um, these fishes essentially might be replaced seven times a year. So they might account for 60% of the fish flesh that's actually eaten on a reef, even though they don't kind of show up. So I think that's really, really important to know and to understand. Um, it can help explain a paradox about reefs is that, you know, reefs, corals live in these clear tropical waters, but they don't usually have a lot of nutrients. Um, so where do the nutrients come from to support these really lush communities? And I'm just ignoring all the other problems that tropical reefs have at the moment. Um, you know, cryptobenthics may help explain that they might feed as larvae in offshore waters and then move back to the reefs so they're essentially transferring um energy from other areas onto the reef where it can then support everything else that's flourishing there's other ideas for example um seabirds dropping their guano and so on but i just thought this was really cool because again it's this idea that when you think about something differently or when you consider something's life cycle in more detail you can get a different picture of the mechanisms by which things work. So, yeah, so maybe in terms of total biomass of these species in a snapshot of time, maybe they don't seem so significant. But when you consider the degree that they're eaten and replaced, they could be really, really um, important. And, under, and, you know, reefs are in such trouble. The more we know about them, the more we can hopefully target our efforts to the best things to save them. But it also, it just, again, it's that looking at things in a different way or just something that may seem really rigorous. Like, yeah, we, you know, I don't know exactly how they do ecological surveys, but we caught everything and we estimated mm. everything and we weighed everything, but they're not necessarily extrapolating and, you know, understanding the life cycles and how that fits in. It can just mean that we might um, not give things the importance that they do deserve. It, it's really a story about how we've overlooked a particular data mm. point. We've sort of taken it for granted that there's X amount of these cryptobenthics and they have a certain role to play, but it's only until someone actually drills down and looks in detail about their life cycle mm. and things that you go, wait, these are much more important than we thought. They are the major yeah. food supply for the reef. But, you know, on the other hand, like they're not that charismatic mm. megafauna. They never will be. And, yeah, I don't know. I, I just find it really interesting, that intersection of, like, you know, science as finding about what's going on, but then the way that scientists as humans kind of relate to things and think about things. And it's often quite hard to step out of your, um, you know, the way that, that you view the world. View or, you know, the, we, the, we tend the, to yeah. only look at the, well, the, the big, the, the bright, the colourful, find. the obvious and it's often the more yeah. mundane things that we take for granted. Mm. Mm. That's cool. But, Lucas, let's move on and talk about how all black holes spin, or at least as far as we know, they all do. Because now using data from NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, astronomers have been able to measure the spin of five supermassive black holes, one of which was spinning at faster than 70% the speed of light, that's really fast. Very fast. Fa like, fast. An insane amount of speed. It's fast. It's an insane amount of speed. <laughs> like, we're getting, we're getting, like, we're well and truly into relative, relativistic speeds here. This is when, when relativity um, and, and, and time start to act differently at these speeds, significantly And that's what makes it so interesting, really, because when you think of 
approaching the speed of light. You know, we know that nothing with mass can travel at the speed of light. And then you have a super massive right. black hole, which by definition have a lot of mass to be going that fast. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not the mass, it's not the black hole that's going fast. So it's the, it's the accretion disk around it. It's the material that's all, that's all yep. trying to, but, you know, cram its way into the gaping more of the, 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 the feeding black okay, hole. That's a good point. Sorry, I felt all poetic there for a <laughs> you moment. You did. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it, so, so it's not the black yeah. hole. It's the, it's okay. the stuff no, I around was, it. I was wrong on that. You were right to pick me up. But it's still extraordinary that it can be spinning so quickly and that just shows the energy that so much mass would have. Well, yeah, I mean, and we're talking here about supermassive black holes. These are the, the big, big, big buggers that are thought to be in the centre of pretty much all galaxies. So we've covered it many times on the show, talked about supermassive black holes, and we keep learning more and more about these beasts. Um, uh, we've, we've up until now not had any way of determining the spin rate of material around them. So this group using the, the Chandra uh, X-ray observatory worked out this technique to, to calculate the spin rate of the uh, matter around these distant black holes. And, and what they found was that the, the X-rays that these, these black holes, these feeding ones, which are, which are known as quasars, um, they're generating, you know, this huge uh, amount of X-rays. And the X-rays are coming from a part of the accretion disk, which is all of that matter that's, that's you know, spinning around, you know, trying to make its way into the event horizon of the, the black hole. It, it's, it's coming from an area of the disk that's really just only slightly larger than the event horizon itself. So what we're seeing in these X-rays is actually this material basically crossing that that barrier, crossing that that frontier into into the um, into the event horizon. So that's that's the the point of no return. That's that's when it's uh, it's all done. You're you're all gone, and we're not going to see your X-rays anymore. Thank you very much. Um, so to think that these things, I mean, just in terms of putting some some concept around the speed here. Um, it's it's quoted at, at uh, the speeds in around 670 million miles an hour. Um, that's freaking it's fast. fast. Freaking, I've written in the I've written in my margin. Freaking <laughs> fast. Um, it's very fast. The other important part about this is the the technique that they they use to find it is our old friend gravitational yeah. lensing. So if you recall, we've we've talked about gravitational lensing a number of times before. This is this uh, really cool. Um, gravitational effect that that means that if you've got something with great mass in front of something else with mass, then the the gravity can basically bend the light around it and can cause it to become magnified. So that that process, which we call gravitational lensing, is basic. It's almost like having a magnifying glass in between you and the the, the distant object. So in this case, they they benefited from the fact that there was this awesome chance alignment of of some galaxies in front of the galaxy that they were uh, the quasar that they were observing, which allowed them to see the uh, the X rays basically magnified and, and amplified, so that we could we could do these measurements. So. Very, very cool, and and again, these these uh, gravitational lensing of uh, you know just is is like a secret mm-hmm. weapon in many many respects, you know, giving us access to information that we otherwise wouldn't have. And if you if you ever get a, if you're ever interested in in looking into gravitational lensing, of that it causes this weird sort of ghosting of images where you have multiples of of the the object in the background. It it appears multiple times in the sky. That's just so bizarre to think this is this is something that nature produces. It's really really cool. So so basically, yeah, they they took a, uh, advantage of gravitational lensing. They used uh, the the Chandra uh, X ray uh, telescope to 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 view the the secretion disk, and and they were able to to you know use a technique from the X rays to calculate the spin rate, and that's the new thing. It's almost like you know, when you think of um, quantum stuff, you know, we keep talking about how we, or, or even with photons, you can you can either know where it is or how fast it's going. You can't know both. It's kind of, you know, it, it's a little bit like that, or it has been up until now, whereas this time we, we've actually been able to measure spin rate. And that just tells us a huge amount because we can, we can figure out the rough mass 
of these these uh, black holes by the interactions with things around them, uh, i.e., I'm talking about the interactions with the stars around them, mm-hmm. right? Because we can, we can, for example, we can we can look at um, other stars that are flinging around the supermassive black holes, and we can figure out based on the luminosity of those stars, and the, we can look at the um, radio spectra of the star to figure out what the star is made of. And there's a whole lot of things that we can we can indirectly get to the the mass of that star, and then based on the speed that it's moving around we can then use that to calculate the you know the 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 mass of the black hole which i still find just so awesome that we've got these techniques but uh but now as i say we can get to the spin rate as well and that tells us a huge amount because um just think back it wasn't that long ago we, we we basically considered it impossible to know for sure whether there was a black hole anywhere um now we're talking about measuring how fast it's feeding it's just ridiculous. And also, cool. it was only a few months ago we actually got the first ever photograph of the accretion disk of a black hole. And yes. now we're actually measuring the spin right. of that accretion disk. So, I know. It, it's it's so easy, I think, to, to feel that we, we missed out on the, you know, the, the, the renaissance period of science where so much stuff happened, you know, in, in, a, in a period of time where, where we just had some incredible thinkers that were coming up with stuff. But we are just reaping the rewards right now in terms of the technology that we have yeah. and the, 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 the ways that, that, yeah, big data and also the ways that, that sci- scientists are figuring out how to reuse things that we already know. I mean, we last week we talked about um, some data that had been collected many years ago, but they they were able to then relook at that data using new techniques, which have come out of technological advances. And the I think the other thing that that just always impresses me is that it's very tempting to want to consider um, new. Uh, certainly, new theories that that, are, that appear to be emerging as being, you know, the work of some lone mm-hmm. genius. But that, but it's not. It, it isn't like that anymore. It's it's and and off and really hasn't been like that for most of most of uh, science's history. There are some that have done incredible work, but generally speaking, it's huge teams of people that are that are collaborating that that come up with these things. So it's just it's it just blows my huge mind. Huge teams of people, and also Elon Musk, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> yep. When he's not sending uh, uh, Teslas into space or building submarines that may or may not ever have reached where they had to go. Uh, I saw another story about him today about a, the neural net that they've been mm. building. Um, this neural, uh, which which uh, looks like an emerging story that we may end up covering. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And Elon. <laughs> right. But it is interesting, though, that you mentioned that analysis of previous data and looking back at things uh, from a new perspective, because that actually ties in very neatly with our next story, Penny, which is all about human migration, early human migration. And it seems like it's becoming a bit of a trope for us now that every few months we have a story that pushes back some milestone of early human migration, whether it's when humans first settled in Australia or when earlier migrations to South America happened or I mean, now there's a new analysis of skulls found in the 70s in Greece that puts back the time when humans moved out of Africa and into Europe to around 210,000 years ago. It just gets pushed back and back further, doesn't it? It does. And it's really interesting because, like you said, it has become a bit of a thing for us. Part of it is because I think I like selection bias. <laughs> I like talking about them. But I do feel like even in the last couple of years, I mean, we've been doing this show for quite a while. There's been more of this research and like reevaluation of old data. Look, maybe again that selection bias. I have not done any kind of detailed study, but it makes me wonder if you know the whole like multi-regional and out of Africa hypothesis. And this is this, and there's this neat data, and this is that, and there's this neat data. And I feel like I wonder what people will be taught in a hundred years about human evolution and how all this new data comes together, if we will come up with another kind of neat picture or if the whole thing was actually just a great big ginormous mess. So, (laughs) which is not just, which is not, doesn't make it any less legitimate. So what's been found is it was two fossils found in Greece in the 1970s and Greece is quite significant 
as a location. It's in Europe. So it's, you know, it's not in the Middle East. And it's also one of the places in Europe which you could probably retreat to in an ice age and not, you know, it is essentially... Good, good climate. You know, it's, it would be sort of somewhat habit, habitable. You won't freeze to death instantly. Um, so the, the two so it's, like a, it's, it's like their version of the, uh, you know, the tropical getaway <laughs> yeah. that we would have now. It's like I feel I've had enough of the ice age for a little while. I just oh, need some time to... Gosh, I feel like uh, I could do with some uh, Greek islands. Yes. But anyway. <laughs> I hear you. Yes. <laughs> anyway. But um, so both of these skulls were initially identified as Neanderthals. And, you know, there they are, Neanderthals in Europe. It's kind of what we expect to, to find. But um, what's recently been found is that one of the skulls is actually um, probably not a Neanderthal skull, but a modern human skull, which is 2,100, sorry, yeah. 210,000. 210,000. <laughs> I can't do numbers to that. That's not right. 2,000 years no. is not right. Um, so 210,000 years ago. So that's really, really interesting because it puts another sort of nail in the coffin of our not linear out of Africa story because I think there's a recognition that it's not linear. I mean, that whole way that it's changed from the march of progress, we, we recognise that the human tree was a branching one. We recognise that there's not just like, let's leave Africa mm. and, you know, one organised migration. But there is this story that modern humans came out of Africa around 70, 80,000 years ago. There was Neanderthals in Europe. They got, we dis, we, you know, humans, modern humans displaced them about 40,000 years ago. Maybe they interbred a bit, maybe they didn't. What's the evidence? We'd like to know, etc. Um, but this story is just getting more complicated. We've now know that we've found, um, modern humans evidence of their remains from th 300,000 years ago from Morocco and from the Levant as well, some pretty ancient specimens, which suggests that rather than this clean sweep of replacement, you may have had humans and Neand modern humans and Neanderthal humans kind of occupying the same place in different times, back and forth, um, advancing, retreating, interbreeding, Denisovans. It's mm. all just getting... Complicated. <laughs> really messy, complicated. And it does make me wonder if there will be a neat, understandable story that comes out of it. Because sometimes in science, you know, there is. Mm. Or if it is just going to be one of those incredibly complicated things where we're trying to understand our own. Well, well it, it, it's, it's not really our past, but, you know, it is the past of our species hmm. and other related. But it's, yeah. it's so difficult when you have 300,000 or more years of history to analyse and just a few sporadic yeah. bits of evidence mm. here. Like, so this 210,000-year-old skull in Greece, we don't know if that was a population that moved to Greece and then flourished further into Europe or they just died and left yeah. no more ancestors and there was a later spread that came through Africa. And, uh, well, we don't we have know. No idea. I mean, obviously, everyone would love some DNA. Mm -hmm. I have no idea if that's going to happen. But, yeah, especially for humans, it's such small amounts of data and people can do fantastic things, you know, analysing the morphology of these skulls and so on. Like, I'm always amazed at what can be drawn mm. from them. but And also, this wasn't like a complete just, skull either. It was fragments of skull. No, it was just some bits. Computer generated they'd been, uh, a reconstruction. They'd been warped and um, changed in shape. And the shape of the skull is really important to tell which species it is. So... It's a hot mess. <laughs> like, it's a hot mess. It's a hot mess. I'm like... In a way, and what what has been said is, you know, we probably need a bit of archaeology now to see, like, is there ever any evidence of, like, where these humans mm. were, of what they were doing, which is kind of what's been found in Australia recently, is what they were doing, perhaps, perhaps not, but not concrete evidence of their remains. So it's really, really, I find it fascinating. I, um, I know I've said before that my mother tells me, you know, when she went to uni, she was told in first year or something, oh, there's this crazy theory, plate tectonics. Look, we just mm -hmm. we've got to tell you about it, but you know, but it's yeah. crackpot. They've told us we've got to and, tell you. You know, that's just my mum. <laughs> this is not like 
oh, my great, 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 great yep. grandfather. Yep. So things can change, change in yeah. science rapid and rapidly too. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's exciting. I've always been fascinated by human evolution. And, and this is also, again, another story of where we've seen something and we've assumed it was that or we've categorized it as Neanderthals. Yeah. And it's 40, 50 years later, we look back and we go, oh, actually, no, oh, this is something very actually, different. Which yeah. means, can you then go back to that site where you found them and what other evidence is there and how does that necessarily change all the conclusions that we drew from that site that maybe we thought was a Neanderthal site and now it's a human site mm. and everything. Exactly. like Or, or a combined yeah. site, a bit of yeah. both. So it can all change so many things from now on. It's it's fascinating. All right. It is. Well, Lucas, let's talk about kids these days. And you know what's wrong with kids? Like what's really, really wrong with kids these days? They never look up from their damn Parents. phones. Seriously, have you noticed that? They're never <laughs> looking up. They never talk to the person next to them. They're buried away in their own little world. What's the harm in that? Oh, you sound so old. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's intentional. Um, well, what is the harm in that? I mean, we, we keep seeing that, that there's like, um, what what would you call it? It's almost like shame. It's like shame news mm. articles of, of, of constantly telling parents why they're bad, what they're doing wrong to their yep. parents, uh, sorry, to their children, <laughs> yep. and why the children are the worst children e that they've ever been in all of the children's generations. Of course, this happens every generation. <laughs> every generation are worse than the ones before. And I, I don't have that view generally. Just as a sidebar, I, I, keep, I keep having interactions with teenagers in various settings these days, mainly from my my own teenage children meeting their friends and, and at the school helping out with their music program and stuff. And I just, I, I'm constantly uh, uh, impressed with teenagers mm -hmm. lately. Like, lately. <laughs> like, you know, teenagers now are so the teenagers much better are coming than teenagers constantly. Now, than the yeah. teens of the 90s. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. I just like it. It's, it's very, I think it's very tempting to think that, that um, you know, to, to accept the media view that seems to be, put across all the time, as I mentioned just before, that, that, that every generation is getting worse and more selfish and whatever. And that's just not my experience. Anyway, nothing to do with the podcast that just, just came up because you, you mentioned it. So this story is actually, it's, it's a, a conversation that took place on the All in the Mind podcast on, on Radio National, which by the way, I love. It's a fantastic podcast. I've got a, a, a very strong interest in in psychology and, and neuropsychology and so forth. So it's it's very uh, interesting to me. This particular conversation was with uh, Dr. Fiona Kerr from the Neurotech Institute, who's done some um, studies. Her, her particular area of study is looking at um, brain chemical reactions uh, under certain certain circumstances and, and how that impacts upon the body. So her, basically, she, she measures the chemicals and the, and the physiological changes inside the body um, under circumstances that, that she creates in, in sort of laboratory uh, environments. And one of the things that's, that's come out of her research that she discussed with Lynn Malcolm was that the, our generation, or not just our generation, but, the, but people today tend to spend a lot of time looking at mobile phones. And she used the example of like just in a queue. I right? imagine you're in a queue in a, in a bank. And this, you know, for me, I'm absolutely the sort of person who would consider that dead time, wasted time, and I would probably get out my phone and I would start reading. Yep. I also spend a lot of time in in my car, right? So I drive a lot for work. I'm, I'm off on the road. And during those times, I tend to fill the time with podcasts or, or audio books or something like that to, to keep my brain active. And I just, you know, I feel like I'm wasting time if I'm not doing it. But 
and I'll come back to that point actually because I think it's relevant to something else that's that's in this study. But um, I, I think we're all guilty of this, right? Well, when I say guilty, uh, that's that's passing judgment, and I don't mean it that way. I think this is something we I, all. Do, I think right? listening we, to podcasts wanna, in yeah. the car is a very good idea, and more people should listen to podcasts <laughs> more often. Actually, maybe one of Australia's <laughs> longest running science podcast. I wonder how many people are, are listening to this podcast in a car right now, going, "Am I am I wrong? Am I bad for doing this? No, you." Are are absolutely no, you're not, not bad absolutely for doing not. it. We, we <laughs> praise your decision. Um, but anyway, my point is, you know, we kind of think that this is dead time. And and Dr. Kerr's um, uh, uh, observation from her from her studies is that the 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 time that we don't spend doing nothing anymore, or the time that we don't spend interacting with just whoever's around, strangers, whomever has a very different impact on our brains. And I found this very, very interesting. So Dr. Kerr studies um, these neurons that are, that are known as spindle and mirror neurons. So basically, these are the neurons that that um, involved in this in, in brain connections of recognising behaviour and others. And they also have impacts on the hormones you feel uh, that, are, that are created, the, the chemical hormones, the oxytocin and dopamine and, and the vasopressin, which are, are chemicals that your body creates during different types of interactions with people. Now, if you are standing in a queue, going back to that particular scenario, and you, you know, you start talking to a stranger uh, around you and you start sharing some, you know, joke or whatever about your, your shared experience, how long you're in the line or whatever, whatever, it actually has measurable effects on the brain. And there's, there's, neur- there's neuron activity and there are, you know, production of various, um, you know, of, of these uh, chemicals, these hormones, which have an impact on how we remember things and how we relate to things and what our emotional attachment to things is and so forth. And if you end up having a conversation that goes on long enough or it's, it's funny or memorable in some way, then it actually has an, an impact on our parasympathetic nervous system as well and can have an impact on the immune system. It's just really mind-blowing to think that so much could potentially come from what otherwise would seem just a, a very mundane and uninteresting um, interaction with someone. I find I talk to cab drivers and Uber drivers a lot, and I have generally found talking to cab drivers and Uber drivers often late at night when I'm going to a hotel or something like that after I've got off a plane – I really, and I often tweet about this and comment on Facebook about the fascinating conversations I've had with people in the car. And I, I think I, I must get a bit of a, a dopamine hit out of this because now I really quite look forward to it, if that makes sense. So I get into, I know we're talking about myself here and not, not this research, but it did resonate with me because of my own experiences. And, and I've certainly found that I am much less likely, unless I'm particularly tired, to sit in a cab and look at my phone and read emails than I used to be. And I, and I think it's because I've had these positive interactions. So I've built up this Pavlovian response of, of, of having this desire to talk to cab drivers about their lives and so forth. So in addition to that, there also are some comments that Dr. Kerr makes about um, doing nothing. So, and this is this is what made me think of the car for me because there are times when I have I start to feel a little bit you know beaten down or or, or emotionally drained and I can't really face a podcast or I can't really face an audio book or something like that and listening to music or indeed listening to nothing at all is sometimes exactly what I need when I'm when I'm driving and 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 the point that Dr. Kerr made here is these are the times when we're not really doing anything we're not we're not actively absorbing any information that we are more likely to start having abstract and creative thoughts and that is absolutely that's that's my shower time, right? So if I'm in the shower, that's when I start, you know, having these breakthroughs of, oh my god, how did I not think of trying that thing that way? Because that might work. But I, but it happens in the shower. It happens in the car when when I've got no distractions, no no audio books or podcasts on, because my brain is idle. It, like it's my brain is not being fed, so it starts to make its own fun. I think basically. <laughs> um, and it goes, all right, we need something to chew on. Let's start thinking about stuff that's in the back of the mind. So 
I thought that was really interesting as well. That 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 there's some there's some real measurable value in not doing anything, in not actually consuming information. So that so that even if you just stand in in that bank queue and don't talk to someone, but you don't look at your phone, you don't read, you don't whatever, then you potentially are doing something that is good for your brain anyway, just by doing nothing. I, which I is think interesting. This is all a matter of balance. Like, it's too easy to oh, say sure. mobile phones are bad, people don't talk to each other, people don't daydream and that we've lost our creativity and everything. I don't think it's anywhere near as dire as that. But I think there is some... Oh, no, absolutely. I totally agree. There is some agree. definite benefit totally agree. to this, switching this... off every now and then or to having some dead time, as you call it, or just listening to something. And, and also, there's a lot of value to interacting with other people. But I, I just think it's... There is, but the, uh, 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 it is absolutely, and there, there has to be a balance. And this is why I say that for me, sometimes I feel like this, sometimes I feel like that, and I'll do different things. But it definitely has, it definitely results in a different pattern of thinking for me, depending on that what the stimulus mm-hmm. is, and, and whether or not there's any stimulus. And for me, what what was interesting about this is there's some science behind this in measuring the different chemicals that are being created under different different circumstances. She she also uses some examples of say nurses nurses that are taking your history, talking to you in a hospital, getting the information from you, filling out your records, maybe taking your blood pressure, that sort of thing. There tends to be both a lot of tactile involvement, so that you know they're actually touching you during that process. And there also tends to be a lot of eye contact. And the eye contact itself has again measurable chemical impacts on your brain. And that eye contact and the touching there are technological considerations here as hospitals are starting to move towards using things like tablets mm-hmm. for collecting that information. So the, the example that Dr. Kerr raised was you see more and more nurses particularly because they're often the ones who are taking the medical histories, um, will now spend most of that consultation time in certain circumstances looking at a tablet because it's hard to interact with a digital device without looking at it. Now, it is quite easy for people who do it all the time to take handwritten notes whilst maintaining quite a lot of eye contact. I do this in my job all the time. Um, In my case, I tend to use a keyboard whenever I can if I'm not using a pen because I can touch type. So I can maintain eye contact with the person I'm speaking to when I'm consulting with them. If I don't have a keyboard, I have to then look at the device because you can't use a touchscreen device. Mm. You know, you don't have that tactile feedback. So it's really interesting considering that, okay, if we are, for example, if we're building new systems, and this is something that's very near and dear to me because this is what I really do for a living. If we're building new systems that on the surface sound like they're going to be fantastic for for helping nurses very rapidly collect the information that is then used for diagnostic purposes or streamlining back in processes to get people into wherever they need to go whether it's you know into the to uh, pathology or they need to go to x-ray or whatever whatever really quickly there are other things that are at play here and one of them is the trust and the relationship that's actually built up between the patient and the nurse during that consultation, that is undermined if there's no contact, if there's no eye contact, for example. Very interesting. I mean, it sounds obvious when you when you think about it, but this study, these studies, I should say series of studies, um, show that there's actual measurable effects of having a different approach with your with your patient. Another example that she brought up, and this again sound, and we talked about this just very briefly before we started recording the show. But another example was breastfeeding mothers. Now, it, it it there were so many things in this that sounded like the typical blaming, making you feel guilty mm. stuff that we see clickbaity headlines. You know, it kids are bad, mobile phones are bad, blah 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 blah. And maybe it was written that way intentionally to bring people to it, but then they kind of give you a dose of science in it, which I like, right? So, you know, it was like, yeah, haha, we got you here under false pretenses. We we thought we, you thought you were clickbaity, but we're actually going to throw some science down upon you. Um, and again, she talks, as I say, she she brought up this example of uh, of mothers breastfeeding, and she's saying she has seen uh, recently 
uh, something that's been quite concerning her because of her studies, and she does know that there are impacts from so there's 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 certain hormonal and chemical stuff that's going on when a baby is breastfeeding for both both people involved in in the process. Now, this typically is seen and as it is well accepted as a very important bonding time for, for mothers and babies. And obviously, you know, it's not just breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is, is particularly uh, uh, important for, uh, is particularly well studied for this, I should say. But a lot of the same stuff happens even just with feeding babies if you're not breastfeeding, right? So it's not a, it's not one of those, if you don't breastfeed your baby, you're, you're really bad sort of things, because a lot of people can't for lots of good reasons. But Regardless, talking about breastfeeding or feeding your child, if if you're feeding your child and um, it, it's very it's very hard as a parent not to look into the face of your child and just you know marvel at them and have that sort of gooey sort of feeling that you have as a as a parent when you're feeding them and mothers feeding their their children breastfeeding their children are, are very strongly so, but she's seen a trend lately of mothers. Do, you know, doing the same thing, filling the time. This is dead time. I, I need to be doing stuff. There's this constant drive to be productive. So if the mothers are on their phones, answering emails, doing stuff like that, trying to do the right thing, they're potentially actually missing out on building some of that relationship with the child because the measurable impact on the child's brain from that eye to eye contact. So uh, maybe they need two tablets, like one of them just showing their eyes mm -hmm. in front of the baby whilst they actually look somewhere else. I don't know. Maybe there's a technological solution for it. But it is really interesting. Um, and, and as I said, I like the fact that it threw some science down rather than just the clickbait. Sure. And I think, again, it's balance. Like, I've never breastfed a child, but I can imagine it would get pretty tedious after sure. a while. And you don't, you can't. Oh, especially like at three yeah. in the morning. I was just going to mention <laughs> three in the morning. <laughs> so maybe yeah. that's because yeah, sometimes yeah. it was lovely, and sometimes I just wanted to be anywhere else. And I oh, also I think totally, yeah, like it's possible that having my phone at those times just again, this is not anything helped with depression and you know feeling connected to other that's people because right. I chat to my mother's group on WhatsApp like yeah. who's up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. It's, it's Which other mothers are up at three in the morning? Yeah. And again, I, I totally ag agree, Ed and I, and I uh, and Penny. I think it, you know, absolutely everything is well, about like balance. Like you said, it's about I, balance and swings and roundabouts and, mm. and other metaphors. It is. I just, as I say, I think it's it's interesting to um, to hear it not from just a, a, a judge, not from a tabloid. You know, you're doing the wrong thing, but consider these things. Right? There are actually some. There's actually some neuroscience going mm. on here. With, with different types of interactions with people. And I, I think I've been through this, this phase of my, uh, my life where I, I've found it very hard not to be distracted by devices around me and, and that, you know, in, whether it's at home, at work, or just, you know, talking to people. I now make a really conscious effort to keep, to put my phone away if I'm at a cafe with someone or whatever. It's a case of anything that, if that thing's buzzing in my, in my pocket, I don't care. I'm I'm there with the person, right? I want to connect with that person, and I and I, I actually feel better for it. Um, I think so. Also, maybe this story just spoke to me. These devices are new to us. We haven't had our parents from mm -hmm. a young age say, yeah. "This is a phone," and you know we don't use it all the time. Like it, you know, they just came on us fully formed, and no one had taught us responsible ways of managing it. Just like you might learn how to drink responsibly because of your culture or whatever. So and as a society, hopefully. We're yeah. developing social norms and what is acceptable and what is not. It's not acceptable to be at a cafe with someone and constantly looking at your phone and not actually make eye contact with them. That's, I think, generally not acceptable. But, but kids these yeah, but days. But how often do you see it? I see it all <laughs> the time. Okay. All the time. And I've been totally guilty of it as well, that, that, that um, you know, you'll be with someone, especially if you're with a group of people, you, you will often see some of those people drift off, play with their phones for a little while and then come back. Not physically, drift off, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean. They, they're they're not engaged for a little while. And I think of our gatherings, mm -hmm. not 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 you particularly, but but people in our in our friendship group. This is this is something that I certainly observe quite a bit with our group. That someone will check their phone, do some stuff, and then they're back into the conversation, in and out, in and out. She's not on the show tonight. You can say it's Joe that you're talking about. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is totally Joe. <laughs> no, but 
<laughs> Again, it's balance and it's these are social norms that we're working out what is acceptable and what isn't. And it's going to be different for different groups. There are going to be some groups where that won't happen and, and I- some where it will. So. Can I also point out one other thing, just and this is particularly in relation to to young people. I had this this very detailed conversation with my own mum about this recently because she was, you know, lamenting at the the way that kids are, are not not seeing their their friends mm-hmm. much. You know, they don't spend time with their friends. They everything's via text and stuff like that. But but there's so many reasons for this. Like our kids don't have the freedom that that certainly my generation had as kids. We we were allowed to be out uh, in the, late in the afternoon. It was ca- the general rule was be home by mm. dark, you know. And we didn't have mobile phone. We didn't have any of that stuff with us. Our parents actually didn't know where we were at any given time. We were in the neighbourhood, right? We were we were with other people. I'm talking about yeah, when we were yeah. younger. When we were older, I think my generation certainly had a lot more freedom as teenagers than now. I think think parents are a lot more concerned now about kids, you know, and younger teenagers and so forth being out and about. And also there's a lot more dual income families now than back in when I was a kid. So so parents aren't there to be running their their kids around to all of these, you know, seeing all their friends and all that sort of stuff. So I think there's just so many layers of this. So when we, it's easy to be critical of teenagers using using phones to converse with their with their friends, but that is actually how they do friendship now. That that's actually that is their friendship, and I don't I don't think that's a bad thing. It's just a, it's, it's different, just different, exactly. and it's a part of that journey that you you and Penny were just saying. This is just as we're figuring it out. Yeah. And speaking about the freedom that we had as kids. Um, I'm watching Stranger Things, and I think maybe it's a good thing that we don't have that freedom anymore because <laughs> <laughs> the sort of things that can go down. All right. Yeah, I'd never had an upside down <laughs> in my neighbourhood, but well, as far as I know, maybe I just yeah, maybe you don't one remember of the main mm. cast. Oh. Right. Well, on that somewhat spooky note, I think we should wrap this up. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 338. Read them on your phone if you want. You don't have to. It's up to you. (laughs) But you should definitely, on your phone, go to scienceontop.com slash donate to become a Patreon supporter and help us make the show. Thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And this was our last episode for this season. Oh, is it? Oh, there you go. It snuck up, didn't it? (laughs) It did. Uh, so we're going to have a short break for a couple of weeks and then we'll be back again putting signs on top of the agenda. Join us then. This is the first of their glaciers to be lost to climate change. We feel like there's an important connection to be made between melting glaciers, sea level rise and the world's cities. One of the things that has happened that's important with Oak Glacier is that it's, it's lost so much mass now that it can no longer move under its own weight. Because it no longer moves under its own weight, it's what they call dead ice. It's, it's dead, it's no longer moving, it's no longer alive. The plaque is set up as a letter to the future. It's made of brass and it has words in Icelandic and English. And it essentially says, Auk is the first of Iceland's glaciers to be lost to climate change. In the next 200 years, all of Iceland's glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This is to acknowledge that we know it needs to be done, and only you will know if we did it. Takeaway message of the memorial plaque. To mourn the loss of this glacier, but more importantly, to move forward to prevent further losses in the future.